Fantastic. Thanks so much, Lisa. It is awesome to be here with everyone today, even if it's a virtual platform. It's fun to be able to reach so many. And I could see in the chat function that you're from all over, which is a really great thing to be able to see. And so Lisa already introduced um, myself as well as what we'll be doing today. But to give you a little bit of a uh, help you understand who Derry West is in case you're not familiar. Dairy West is one of our local Dairy Council organizations, so we cover the areas of both Utah and Idaho. And if we look at this next slide, this is a picture depicting all of the different state and regional Dairy Council organizations. So depending on where you live would depend on which regional or state Dairy Council you would be under and who you would contact for resources. And as we go through today, that's going to be my first objective to share with you guys is how you can access those resources and where to go to find out who your local dairy council is. Afterwards, I'm going to go ahead and introduce some class curriculum that can be integrated in while using virtual farm tours. So yesterday, Shiftology went into a lot of detail as far as the logistics and then being an organization that helps to organized farm tours and today I'm going to share a little bit more about the curriculum and how to integrate it into your classroom. And then after that, which is likely the favorite part for everyone here, is going to be able to experience the value of that virtual dairy farm tour to enhance your learning and remembrance of what we do today. So with that, I'm going to show you how to access your local dairy council. So if you go to the link below, which is the usdairy.com, you should come to this screen and this is the National Dairy Council website. And you're gonna find this map again. So it's the same map that I just showed you, just different colors. And it's going to show you what organizations are over your state. And then if you continue scrolling, you can either search and actually type in your state here or you can click on it. So for example, I just clicked on Arizona. They're under the Dairy Council of Arizona. And then you have their contact information and importantly, their website you can go to, to find out what resources they have there. And so you could do that with any of the states. So if you were from Indiana, you would be under the American Dairy Association of Indiana, and then it has their contact information. So that is the website you're going to go to there. And why it's important to kind of use your local resources is because it is going to have activities and things that fit your local agriculture and what it looks like, and specific, specifically what is going on within dairy where you live. We have several different resources. We all work together a lot, um, but we have different resources depending on the region that we serve. And so there's a lot of times you're going to be able to find curriculum which will fit within your classrooms. Several different organizations do the recorded or live virtual farm tours. So if you were on that last session yesterday, my colleagues from Michigan were on that. And so them as well as several other dairy organizations, if you noticed on their partner page, actually use them to help them to do their virtual farm tours. And then there's lots of other interactive activities you can access there as well. And now moving into the curriculum. And before we start this, I want to share a poll with you guys. So you should be able to see that now. And just to kind of get an idea of who was on the call with us today. So are you K through five educator, six through 12 educator? Are you a volunteer? Do you work with Ag in the Classroom or some other organization? So go ahead and put your answers in there. I'm pretty sure you can see it. Andrea, or excuse me, Rochelle, I think that they, they are unable to use the poll. They're not showing the voting. It's not showing to them. Okay. Let's see if it will show this time. It was, oh, it's going now. Okay, perfect. So go ahead and enter in there what we have with us today, and I'll give you a few more seconds to enter in there.
All right, I'm gonna end that. I know some of you haven't submitted yet, but that's okay. Okay, so it looks like we have the highest amount as part of another educational organization followed by K through five and or wait, six through 12 and then K through five. So we have a pretty good mix of people here today, which is awesome because I'm gonna be sharing educational opportunities all through the K through 12 um, classroom. So these, this curriculum is really designed to help you apply the virtual tours to your core standards. So they're very specific to the different age groups and they're really meant to enhance the learning from the virtual farm tour. So they learn a lot on the farm, just about general agriculture and stuff like that. But then when you can really apply it to some things that they learn about every day, then they're able to uh, learn better and actually have that education and connection to use it in their life more regularly. So it helps to kind of see it in their real life and what is going on there. So as we get into this curriculum, some of these aren't quite published yet, but um, on each slide there's going to be the link for that slide or for that particular lesson that's going to show you where it goes and where you can get access to it. So pay attention to that as we go. So first we have our kindergarten through second grade and this is going to focus on some science standards. So in this group, we are learning a lot about what living things need to survive. So learning about the different types of shelter, what temperature is preferred, food, water, and all those other things that are needed to live. And so to make an agriculture connection with the standard, we've developed this lesson that goes over the basic needs of cows and then looks into detail on how cows and humans have physical differences and that's why farmers care for them and they may live in situations that are a little different than a human might live. So one of the activities here and has come up here on this right side. It's a web basically. And there's a few different ways as a teacher you can actually do this activity. Whether you wanna do it, it's in this PowerPoint so you can just have the PowerPoint up and go through all of the material. Or if you print off the pictures, you can uh, have it a little bit more interactive with the students in being able to have the pictures and put them on the board. So as you can see right here in the middle, we have the dairy cow. And then aside from dairy cow, we're gonna focus on four different things when looking at physical differences. So their mouth and teeth and the different things they eat, how their hair affects the temperature preference, their hooves, and how farmers keep cows clean and comfortable. So for example, when we're looking at the hooves, we'll go into some explanation on how farmers care for the cow's hooves. There's regular hoof trimming. Some farmers have the hoof bath, which they're actually able to walk through on a regular basis. They make sure to keep the alleyways and the places where the cow stays clean, as well as having footing that's um, so that the cows don't slip. So there's lots of different things that the farmers do on a regular basis to help with that. And um, you would go through specific detail on each of those different categories there. In our third through fifth grade, we have science standards that we're gonna focus on through a lesson called Energy's Journey from Farm to You. So this lesson is focusing on the questions, what is energy, what does it look like, where do you get energy, um, how does it move throughout different plants and animals, and really looking into those concepts through looking at energy transfer and specifically talking about photosynthesis. So how we do this is looking at this energy chain. So there are five different steps the students will go through as you go through the energy chain. Starts with the ultimate source of energy being the sun, and then the sun with the process of photosynthesis helps plants to grow. Plants um, are then, cows are able to eat them. The cows get energy from those plants. And then uh, they're able to produce milk because of that energy. And milk is finally in the form of energy, which humans can then eat or drink and get energy to live and grow. So it's following that entire energy process as we look into everything there. Hey, Rochelle, just scroll up a little so they can see the URL at the bottom of your presentation. And we will make these links available to you, I promise. 
Yeah, if you go to the ag, this one's in the matrix. So if you go there and you just search energy, it'll be one of the ones that comes up. And that's the National Ag in the Classroom Curriculum Matrix, agclassroom.org. You'll see the matrix link yep. on the homepage and then just search for, what did you say, Rochelle, just now? If you search for energy, it comes up. Okay, great. Yep. Okay. So then the sixth through eighth grade, this one isn't on the Ag in the Classroom matrix, but it is on our website. So that's the dairywest.com slash farm to school. And this age group is learning a lot about different careers. And so we wanted to make sure to highlight the variety of careers within the dairy community. So a lot of times when I talk to kids, they think the only thing you can do with a dairy farm is to be the actual dairy farmer. And so this lesson is just meant to kind of expand their thoughts on that and understand that there are so many other things that are involved with agriculture and specifically dairy farming and ways that they can incorporate into that. And we do this through while you're listening to a virtual farm tour, there's this worksheet. And so you can see there's five different categories to kind of work through in the worksheet that the students are asked to just kind of use critical thinking skills while the farmer's talking. The farmer may mention specifically some careers or the students can ask, but look at when you're in the milking barn, who do you see in the milking barn? Who do you think helps with the cows? Are there people who help build the building? Are there people who designed the automatic milkers and worked with all of that? So there's several different things that are involved with it. And then moving the last two categories off the dairy farm and seeing what kind of opportunities are involved in processing and kind of the grocery store and consumer standpoint, which is where I work and several of you guys work as far as the education standpoint. Then this next lesson is for ninth through 12th grade, and these focus mainly on nu the nutrition concepts. And again, this one is on the Ag Classroom Matrix. If you search for milk, it will come up. The lesson is called Stacking Up Milk and Milk Substitutes. So there are lots of questions out there as far as what's the difference between milk and almond or soy or oat and all of those different kinds of beverages. What's the difference? Which one should I buy? Um, what am I missing or gleaning from the different options? So this lesson is really geared towards helping students explore some of the facts behind that. And we do this, there are informational cards for all the different beverages. This is just an example of one of them for milk. And so there's kind of this general information card that has the did you know and kind of fun facts, the history like this one has for all of them. And then there's also a card about specifically the nutrition and then one about the processing or how that product gets to the store. So through that, they're able to see all of the different things and what is different between each product. So next time they go to the store or their parents do, they're then geared a little bit better to be ready to make decisions and know the differences between all the different products. And then a few resources that we're currently working on because we know in this ninth through 12th age group, you guys are learning a lot about the after, what happens after the farm. So first we wanna do a comparing like cow and human nutrition goes. So going to a little more detail about what cows eat, what humans eat and how it's actually important, the different things that we eat and how in some ways um, formulating the diet is very similar. And then going into the processing side, which is looking at pasteurization, homogenization, and fortification, and what these processes are, what they look like, why they happen, and if it really affects the nutritional product at the end. So those are all resource, resources that will be coming. So if you check up on our dairywest.com website, you'll see those will start to be posted as we finish them. So with that, that was a very brief snapshot into um, some of the lessons. And I'll do a quick uh, tips for your virtual tour. So these lessons are set up so that you can either join a live virtual tour if you happen to have time. I know that doesn't always fit, so there are also options for recorded virtual tours, as well as most of the lessons have little snippets 
like the short one to two minute videos to also explain some things as well. So there's several options that will fit hopefully within your classroom to incorporate some of that uh, learning from the farm, even if you're not able to do the live virtual tour. And you learned a lot about some of the tips as far as it goes setting up the virtual tour and organization to work with, which that's one of my first tips is to use the organizations that host them. There's a lot involved with the technology and setup and just knowing um, where is their good reception and what farmers can actually um, do the tours because of reception can be an issue. So use those organizations, use your local dairy councils once you go and look up who your dairy council is and use them if you can. If you aren't going to use them, make sure the farmer that you're using can practice and is aware of the curriculum focus and the age group that you are going to pre be presenting to. And then as far as technology goes, this can always be a little bit tricky and daunting, especially the first time. But it's important to test it in advance. As far as the tours we do, it is best if um, the classroom can have a microphone, a sound system, a camera, and good internet access. And we have worked with teachers who don't have all of those, and it still works out pretty well. Um, the sound system and internet and projector are kind of something you have to have, but you can work. The microphone is how you can talk back to the farmer to ask questions. So if you're on a large tour, you wouldn't necessarily need that or the camera, but the smaller tours, it is preferable to have that. So that's um, just some of, some of the details as far as what your classroom setup would look like. And now that we've gone through all of that, we're finally ready to jump into a virtual field trip. So as Lisa stated, we have Siska Reese is going to be joining us and she's going to give us a tour of her dairy farm in Idaho. And so we're really excited to have her. She's done lots of virtual field trips for us in the past. So I'm excited to have her join and share her insights. And as we go through it, I'll try and highlight some of the areas to which she would focus on with the different curriculum as well. And I'll also keep track of our Q&A function so that um, I can insert questions in for Cisco as well. So with that, I'll turn the time over to her. Hi, right, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, awesome. So, I, I'm, my name is Cisco, hi. We have a dairy farm in Idaho, which is actually, um, the shape of Idaho is kind of like an L, and we're in the very bottom southwest corner. So only about an hour from the border, and we're in the Treasure Valley, which is really close to the capital. We're about 45 minutes from the capital, um, and that's where Rochelle is kind of closer to there right now, too. So today I am going to take you through the life of a dairy cow, and I definitely love questions. I love being interactive. This is my fun Silas. Say hi, Silas. And uh, as I see the kids, I'm going to pull them into the dairy tour because I think it's really fun for the kids that you guys have in your classroom to connect with the kids on the farm. And if you guys ever need pen pals, ask the dairy farmers if they have kids that would love to be pen pals because that's another great way to make a connection. And we actually homeschool all of our kids, so I'm a full-time teacher also. And so I loved all your advice. Rochelle about the curriculum and everything for the different students. So I thought that was awesome. So I'm going to turn my thing around here so you can see what I'm looking at, which is way more awesome than me. But this is our close up pen. We have Jersey cows, which are actually the brown cows. They are, uh, there's a couple different breeds that are brown, but Jerseys are the golden brown that you see here. And they are actually a little bit smaller than the black and white Holstein. Another difference is the shape of their face. As you can see, they are super, super calm. They are super just comfortable. Uh, you can't tell right now, but today it's supposed to be 90 over here. And I have a very cool breeze just coming through this barn. Nobody's too hot. You can tell because they're not mooing. Um, close up means that they are close up to having their babies. So this entire pen right here is actually going to have a baby within the next two to three weeks. So the first thing I'm going to do is see if anybody is having a baby right now and 
If they are, you get to witness a live birth. We have about five to 10 calves born a day. This morning, I had nine born already when I got here at 6.30 this morning. And the cool thing about derbies is that they have a really high calving ease, which means they very rarely need help calving. They're able to just push their babies out. They're a lot smaller than Holsteins, so they're able to just push their babies out on their own. We very rarely have to help them by um, helping coax a little baby out. Um, another difference between a Jersey and a Holstein is that their milk is very creamy. So they have about 30% um, more fat, which means that they will actually have um, a lot more ability to make more cheese and yogurt and ice cream with the same gallon of milk. When we drink milk actually off of, from our dairy, raw milk, and um, we have the milk in milk cans and the top, I would say 40% of our jug is solid heavy cream if I let it sit overnight. So that is really, really cool. Um, Another difference between a Jersey and a Holstein is their personality. Their personality, uh, the Jerseys are a lot more curious and people, they like people a lot more. So as you can see, they're making their way over to me because they're like, what's going on? Why is she standing here with her phone? If this was a pen of Holsteins, the black and white cows, they would actually be trying to get away from me and going to the other end of the pen. I actually don't see anybody having a baby right now. Silas, you see anybody having a baby? No? No. Okay, you keep an eye on it. And if somebody starts having a baby, you let us know, okay? okay. And we'll come back and watch it. All right. We have a question. So they're wondering how old the cows are that are here, but maybe how old they are when Wait they Wait a second. Have. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Okay. Hang on. Here, hold this up. Hold this up for Mama. Okay, Rochelle, did you say something? Yes, can you hear me oh, now? sorry. Yes, You're okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, they want to know how old the cows are here and maybe just how old they are when they do have their first baby or your average age. Okay. So cows are actually, these, these cows are all ages, um, all the way from, I guess the youngest would be about two years old. Uh, they are teenagers when they're about one year old. And so we will breed them then, and then they will have their babies. They're actually pregnant, just like humans, for about nine months, almost to the day. So that's really exciting, a, a fun fact about cows and humans. And uh, so the youngest in here would be around two years, the oldest. They live to be 10, 11, or 12. Um, by the time they're that age, they're getting pretty old. Um, but they, as you can see, live a very calm and gentle lifestyle. So. Go ahead and interrupt if there's any cool questions. I see, I see some, yes, when the cow has her calf in that pen, do you move them out quickly? Um, we do, and the reason is because, as you can see, there's a lot of mamas in here. And what happens for the survival of a calf, when they come out, they land on this fresh straw, as you can see. But what happens is if they jump up and start drinking on their mama's udders and their teeth, before we have a chance to sterilize them, then the calves will get bacteria in their stomachs before they get colostrum. If they get bacteria in their stomachs before they get colostrum, it is very, very difficult to help them survive. So it is very important that we get them colostrum and we sterilize the mommy's teeth before we um, have, the mom, have the baby's milk. Okay, so I'm gonna take you right over here. This is our half bottle room. These are baby calves that were born this morning. Like I told you, there were nine of them. So most of these are females because we actually do use um, semen uh, from artificial insemination. And we, um, they have technology now that can actually sex the babies. And so these babies, if, uh, a lot of them we get have our girls and we want them to be girls and we give them colostrum. Here's a jug of colostrum that they get. We make sure they get the colostrum within an hour after birth. If they get that colostrum, then their immunity gets built up and they have lots of um, 
antibodies and immune protection so that if they do get exposed to any viruses, then they won't get sick. So this is actually pretty full because like I said, we have about five to 10. Ginger, leave them alone. So it, they're, they're about to move these babies out to their new little hutches. We have about 3,000 jerseys here at this farm. And I'll show you, this is Yoseline, say hi. Yoseline is in charge of our calves over here. So as you can see, she, she keeps really good records. This is the date the calf was born, the number of her mommy. This is gonna be the number of the baby. If it was a heifer or a bull, which heifer is girl, bull is boy. What time the baby was born, what time the baby got colostrum. Right here is um, how much the calf weighs. We keep records of how um, good they're doing with their growth. And then this is the quality of colostrum that they got. We actually measure the colostrum from the mom and give them the colostrum from that mama so that they have the best chance of survival. Every half an hour to an hour, we and her mom walk past the tent to make sure nobody's having a baby. If they are, they make sure and get them out of there before they're trampled or before they get sick. Um, and I'll, oftentimes, if we can get the mom um, separated a little bit from some of the other ones, we'll give them a little bit of time together. So that's nice. Okay, so I'm actually gonna just take you on through the next stage. Can you hold this and show people as we drive? Okay, we had a couple questions in and I think you kind of answered them, but just clarifying. So why they do separate the mom and the baby is she talked a lot about the colostrum and that's super important for the cows to get in order to abs to get in order to be healthy is to get it in that first couple hours because that has a lot of antibodies that help them build up their immune system. So they're kept out or separated for that reason and partially just for their safety as well. Not all mother cows are super motherly and are gonna take care of the baby calves. So we wanna make sure that we step in and take care of them. And we really do love our animals so, so much. And if it wasn't best for them to remove them from their mamas right away, we absolutely would not do it. It is, I have, actually not caught a calf in time and she was trampled by her mom and some other ones and I sit there and I cry looking at this beautiful newborn baby and so it's hard because a lot of people will say that's so cruel how could you do that but really we do it because we love them and we want the best for them these are the boys 4-H animals there's some sheep there's some pigs we're going to show them at the fair next month On our way to the baby calves, I'm going to take you over here to show you the freestall barn. The freestall barn is where the mamas live. So these are the mamas that have already had their babies. Um, the freestall barn is kind of cool because it has little beds for each and every cow. You can see back here. You can see the ground that they're walking on. It is clean. I would happily go in there with my flip-flops. It is nice. You can hear the water is just being rinsed away. We have a flush system that does that um, several times a day to keep it nice. The cows have ear tags so that we can keep, tell them apart, keep track and keep records. They also have pedometers on their feet. I don't know if you can see. Okay, so these pedometers, she's trying to sniff me. <laughs> these pedometers actually will tell us how much, um, it's a computer chip. It'll tell us how much cow milk this cow gives. Every time we milk her, we milk them three times a day. It'll also tell us how many steps she takes. If she's not feeling well, she's not gonna walk as much. So it'll tell us right away as soon as somebody's not feeling well, we can print lists off of our computer to be able to tell um, who's not feeling well. It'll tell us actually when they're in heat, which means they're ready to be bred or cycling, they um, are ovulating. It'll tell us that she is taking, typically they'll take one to 200 steps an hour. And actually when they're in heat, they could take up to seven to 900 steps per hour. So then we'll know exactly. Um, in answer to your question about the mother being stressed, no, she actually, most of the moms are, these are commercial dairy cattle and they are used to being handled by humans and used to their life here and the structure that we have here. Um, cows are 
creatures of habit and leisure and comfort. And so as long as we take care of them and give them all their needs, they really don't stress out that much. In fact, as long as you take care of them and give them what they need, they really don't stress out. Does the breed have anything to do with how many times per day? Nope, that's actually decided by the dairy farm individually. So some dairies will milk them twice a day. Some dairies will milk them three times a day. Those are the two typical ones. We actually, at this farm, will milk our, our fresh ones. So that means they just had their babies. We'll milk them five times a day. And the reason for that is because I don't know if any of you have ever had a baby, but your milk comes in and it feels so good to get it out. And we nurse our babies a lot more than twice a day. So that's why we do that when they are just freshly born. Okay, and there's been a couple of questions come in about whether you guys use AI and if you use sex, sexed semen. Yes, we do AI and we do use sex semen. Um, a cool thing about the dairy industry right now is that a lot of dairies are actually starting to breed to beef cows. So that way they can sell those baby calves back to beef cattle farms for meat rather than raise up um, cows to be dairy cows because you only need we have about 12 1100 or 1200 milking at any given time and we only need about 1200 babies a year um so this right here is their feed it is called total mixed ration it is right now i wish you could feel it and smell it but it's very cold um it feels like it came out of the fridge which is kind of cool because it has molasses in there to make it very sweet it's like syrup to the animals then you'll see the straw, that little piece of yellow right there is corn. There's also some soybean to give them protein. There's some blood meal, there's canola, um, there's hay in there. Um, so you can see just shaking my hand, it's a little bit wet. So it has some residue there. And the reason we give them a total mix ration is that it's consistent. Um, 100% of the time they get that same exact ration. It's very, very healthy for them. Every two hours, they'll come along with a tractor or a four-wheeler or a skid steer, and they'll do what's called pushing in the feed, but it's basically a blade that goes like this and pushes the feed like that, and see how it turned over? It makes the feed fresh and nice, and you never want the feed to get hot because then it will get start to get fermented. So you actually, if you ever see a dairy farm, you'll see these big piles usually. They're white with black tires on them. The, White is plastic, it, it acts just as saran wrap to keep the food uh, fresh. And the black tires are just like weight to hold that saran wrap on so it doesn't blow away in the wind. Okay, let's head on over to the baby calves and what happens to them after they move out of the calf bottle room. We also vaccinate the calves right when they um, are born to make sure that they are vaccinated so they don't get sick. That's our little dog, Ginger. She's actually a puppy and gonna get about twice that big. She's a golden doodle. Our farm is sitting on about 400 acres and so we have all the fields all the way around the farm. Okay, we've had a couple of questions come in and they were, why did you guys choose to milk your cows three times a day is the first one. Okay, we chose to do that because um, like I was explaining, when you have a baby, the more times you release the milk, the more they'll produce. And we, um, we like to relieve that because um, when their udders get really full, it's the same as having a really, really full bladder. And so a lot of people ask, does it hurt when they get milk? And it actually feels so good. It's just like after you have to go potty and you have to go really, really, really bad and then you sit down and you can finally go. It's just so relieving. So that's exactly what it feels like when they milk. So that's why we chose to milk three times a day. And also, I think a lot of dairies choose to milk twice a day because it's how their barn is set up and how much time they have to go ahead and get the animals. It's a big process. And so if you don't have time, we have eight hour shifts. So we can, it takes us eight hours to get all 1200 animals through the barn. 
So if you multiply it times three, you've got your 24 hour day. So some people, it might take them 12 hours to get all, all of their animals to the barn so then they only are able to do it twice. So remember how I was talking about some, are, some dairies are starting to breed to beef? This is a beef calf, so it's a, a little bit darker brown because it was bred to Black Angus. The rest of them are jerseys. So they live in these hutches. You can see them lined up. They're actually uh, insulated right here. They're, you can, they're filled with air. So in the summertime, they're very cool. It's not rare to find my kids all up in there, enjoying themselves out of the heat. And you will also find that um, there's a bottle slide right here. Their bottles get sterilized and they always have fresh water available to them multiple times a day. Well, we keep water in there, so we check them multiple times a day. All right, so we also have rain in here. It's fresh rain for them to always have to get protein and nutrients. So as soon as they're born, they'll have fresh grain and water all the time. Our calves actually get fed with milk in addition three times a day. All right, so after they live in these hutches for about two to three months, and then they move to our community pens. The reason they're separated from one another is because if one of them gets a virus, because calves get their nutrients by sucking on a nipple, if they get sick at all, it spreads very, very quickly because us we are sucking on things all the time. And so we don't want them to get sick. We really want them to stay healthy and protected. And just as a quick connection with a lot of the stuff she's talking about, she's talking about how they care for all these animals and why it looks different, um, why they live in different locations. And that connects really well with that kindergarten through second grade lesson to help people understand those differences and why there are those differences. So fantastic questions to keep asking those so you guys can understand it as well. Yeah, okay, so this is our community pet. As you can see, this is where the babies move after they move out of the hutches. These calves are about four to six months old. This side over here is gonna be six months. And then as I go over here, it'll get closer to four months old. Um, by the time they're here, they'll have their ear tags. Um, their ear tags have their birthday and our logo on them. I'll show you one when we get further here. Hi guys. So these are all girls, like I said. Um, you can see back there, I, I don't know how to zoom on Zoom. <laughs> I don't know how to zoom. But anyways, back there in the middle, you can see they're all laying in the shade, chewing their cud, enjoying. So chewing in their chewing their cud means they, they actually regurgitate some of, uh, cows have a four compartment stomach, so they'll actually regurgitate some of the feed and uh, chew it a second time to swallow it again. As you can see right here under the straw is fresh, dry sand. The reason we use sand is because the bacteria doesn't grow in sand. That's the silage pile I was telling you about. Silage is just chopped up corn or hay or alfalfa. That is fermented, fermenting in that pile. I can uh, make you pass the pile there. This right here is a disc. You can see the sides of that will fold down so you can run it through the field behind the tractor. This right here, uh, behind this tractor, is actually a compost turner. We take all of our manure and turn it into compost, and that blade right under there will actually turn the compost so that it can stay nice and dry. And it, anybody living close to me can come get compost. These are wood chips. There's a pile of sand. Here's a picture of what the silage looks like by itself. It smells a little bit. Or I guess I don't know how to describe it. Punch it, I guess. I think it smells delicious, but that's because I've been around it my whole life. Growing up, my dad had a custom harvesting business. So what he would do is build piles like this on other people's dairies. We didn't have a dairy until I was in college. Uh, high school and college, my family built it together. I have five brothers, and we all built the farm together. And I built the dairy together. With the feed wagon, uh, the loader will actually make different recipes. So just like you, when you make a cake, you use a cup of flour or a 
cup of flour and one cup of butter and a half cup of bitter cream. Same thing. There's actually a, a scale on that cup and on that cracker. And so right now bringing the hay, you can see that he will dump it in there and he's gonna dump it in and watch the scale. And that's just like, instead of measuring cups, he just uses scoops. So see how he's dumping it in? Now, on that one ingredient, he might need some more and he might be done. So these are the, I guess, Tupperware bins that you would keep all the different commodities in. So you can see the yellow right there is corn. Right here is cotton seed. We just bought a load of cotton seed, so it's coming out of the bay, but he'll use it up shortly. So the cool thing about cotton seed is it's very, very soft. It's actually what cotton is so fluffy. And what do you like to do in the cotton seed, Silas? Why? So the boys will actually, you can kind of squeeze it together and it forms so they can like build little caves in here and it gets in all their boots and pockets and everything. <laughs> Okay, so these are the other commodities. Flaked corn. Field corn is different than the corn that we buy at the store. I got some sweet corn last night when I got my groceries. Um, field corn is very similar, it's just not as sweet. I, I love the taste of it because, like I said, I'm used to it, but you guys might not. There's another pile of beans. Okay, Siska, we've got just about five minutes to wrap up, um, but I wanted to focus again, that was talking a lot about the nutrition that cows get, and she talked a lot about things that we can eat, but they're byproducts, like the cotton seed is byproduct from the clothes that we wear, and the lesson, the energy's journey from farm to you goes into a lot of detail regarding the byproducts and why it's important, and a cool thing that cows can take a product that we can't use and we can't get any nutrition or energy from, but they can, and then they produce a product like milk that we can use as far as to get energy and nutrition. We actually have 10 minutes, so we have a little bit more time. Okay, cool. Phew, because it's going to be a lot. <laughs> okay, so this is actually one of my favorite parts of the tour. Go check if there's a baby being born, Silas, and come tell me. This is our front doors here. It'll take us right into our milk room. Our milk room is where the milk is stored in these tanks. They look very small, but they're actually 6,000 gallons each because you can only see the very front of the tank. So those back, each one can hold almost enough milk to fill a swimming pool. So what happens is, I'll get milk over here. I'm gonna give you a better view from up top. But basically they come into this parlor and then their teeth get clean and then it takes three to five minutes to milk them out. And then the automatic milkers will come off automatically. And then the milkers will spray them off with a sterilizer so that they don't get bacteria in the tea ice. And then they will um, go back out to their pet. I'm gonna show you that in just a second because it's a better view from the top. This is just a tank for sterilizing everything. This is um, the pipeline. The milk comes through the pipeline. Right here, there are big filters, very similar to uh, thick coffee filters that come in here and the milk comes through. If you could feel this pipe, it's warm. It's actually about 101 degrees because cows are, their temperatures are 101.5. Then as the, pipe, as the milk comes through this pipe, it's even this plate cooler. And then there's a, electronic cooler where it, the milk goes through. And when it comes out, this bottom keg down here, it is 40 degrees. Then it goes into the tank right here where it's cooled down to another about five to 10 degrees. So it is ice, ice, ice cold when it is stored. A really fun fact about milk is that the cows that are milking right now will get the milk in here in about five to 10 minutes. The milk truck will pick it up tomorrow morning and that milk will be on the shelves ready to drink in the stores in less than 24 hours. So the milk that you buy in the stores is very, very fresh because it is the type of product that has a, a lower end shelf life. Okay, so 
I showed you the cap bottle room where the cabs are. So this is the same same building that we're in. I'll show you that. So here's our sign. I love your guys' comments. If you have any questions, let me know. Yes, Scott, we have some questions in the Q&A box. Can you hear me? Yep. Great. Why, let's see, um, what kind of changes have you had to make about doing the daily work with the risk of COVID? That's a great question. So I was actually a little bit nervous about having strangers come on the farm. Uh, in the dairy industry, there's a lot of things that you have to buy from companies to take care of your animals. And so you get a lot of salesmen coming on the farm. So I restricted our salesmen visits to appointment only. And I also, we posted a sign out front that you couldn't come unless you let us know. And we just tried to keep it like, like the government to essential workers only. Um, so that was one thing that changed. But as far as our daily tasks and what we did, nothing changed. Nothing changed for all of our employees. They came and they, they worked like normal. Everything was the same for us. And what is the name of your farm? Oh, excellent question. Here, I'll show you. It's Mariah Dairy Farm. Here, let me turn this around. So here's all different dairy products. So this is fun to also look up uh, in your classroom because it's kind of each of these things, you would think it's a huge scientific process, but it's just like a paragraph to show what happens to milk, butter, cheese, yogurt. So here's our office where I do my stuff. And right here is my family. So this is my brother and his six kids. These are my parents. And this is my family here. I have four sons. And then here's our dairy farm name with our logo. Very nice. Yeah. Beautiful. Do so, you raise, and then there's another question. Do you raise the young calves that to become beef? Do you use any of your calves for beef? Do we what? I'm sorry. Do you use any of your young calves to become beef? Uh, well, yes, we actually are building a pasture right now currently, and we're going to raise them um, to be beef. Um, in addition to that, we will sell all the bull calves for beef. Uh, families will raise them. So like if you lived in the country and you wanted to get um, a bull calf for your kids to raise, you could do that. Um, An answer to your question about pasture time. Like I said, we're in the middle of building a pasture so that we'll have cows out on pasture. But right now uh, they do get grass fed and that is in their total mix ration. So their nutrients that they get are actually uh, very similar to pasture in their total mix ration. They just don't go out on pasture because we like them to have the shade and the comfort of their free cell bed. A lot, of, a lot of commercial dairies in the U.S. don't do pasture time. Um, if you go closer to the coast or closer to like, I know Australia and New Zealand, they have a lot of dairy farms with pasture, but um, it really is super healthy for them to have the total mixed ration. So I'm gonna take you down there into the parlor so you can hear some of the signs and sounds and you can watch them milk them up close. And did you say that you were breeding with fat beef cows? Yeah, we, we do breed with beef cows and we breed with sex semen. Cool. And how many employees do you currently have and has the pandemic affected your milk production? Um, so yeah, we have about 20, 20 employees um, and about half of them work with the cows and about half of them work with the farm. And as far as our milk production, a lot of the creameries actually were forcing dairy men to dump milk down the drain. We were very blessed in that we didn't have to do that. Um, the nice thing is a lot of them have already bounced back from that. So that's, that's really nice. So did you say you did not have to dump milk because of COVID? Right, our, our dairy did not, a lot of dairy did. I would say over 90% of the dairy did, but we, we did not have to. Can you explain why they had to do that? Yeah, you bet. So the reason they had to do that is because 
what happened when COVID shut down all the restaurants and all the schools is that all the milk that went into so all the milk that went into dairy products and yeast for schools and for restaurants was no longer being bought. So what happened is all the warehouses got full and then they didn't have the ability to make those products and store them for shelf life. You know, sour cream, cheese, everything needs refrigerated space. So what happened was they got to, and there's also correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is they got to overcrowded and so they had to stop the production. And there was also some production plants that actually had COVID in their facility. And so they would have to shut down a whole entire plant. And so what happened was, it wasn't that people were buying enough milk. It was that they couldn't get the milk to the consumer in a efficient fashion. And so we had so many friends that were like, we want to bring them up. And I was like, well, no, but it's the chain in between me and you guys that is making it so hard to to be able to get the product to the consumer. And so then when we started opening up some schools and bringing them there you are. We lost you for a minute. We okay. lost you for a minute. <laughs> and we, what how Cisco is explaining it is perfectly. It, we had to adjust as a food industry in general, and I think they talked about it a little bit in one of the sessions yesterday. But I'll post. We have a video that explains it a little bit. So if you give me a second, um, once we get done, I'll post it in the chat so you can see that as well. And I think with that, we've run up to our hour. So if Siska, do you have any last? There are some questions on where your milk goes. So if you want to just do that really quick and just any final words. Yeah, you bet. So we actually have the milk picked up uh, right here behind me every morning. And the truck takes about two hours away to the cheese plant called Glandia. And they make cheese in uh, Eastern Idaho. And um, all of our milk goes to cheese. And so you can't really bring more milk. All Okay, well, thank you so much, Siska. You've got a beautiful dairy operation and a beautiful family. Thank you so much for sharing it with us and letting us see the animals up close and personal. It was awesome. So, you know, everybody on the chats just sending their kudos and thank you. So thank you so much for your time and thank you to your son. He was a great help too. And uh, Rochelle also a thank you to you and Dairy West for making this possible today. This really was a highlight, I think of our two day virtual summit. So thank you to everybody for joining us. Thank you to Siska and Rochelle and Dairy West for making this possible. And uh, everybody have a great day. Thanks for joining us in our next session. We'll begin at 1.30 Eastern time. Thanks everybody. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Okay,